So what the agent does, it takes actions. And these actions have consequences on the environment. They change the state of the world. Okay? What does the environment do, do on the agent? Well, it sends signals to the agent. The signals are just, we can call them the states. So this is, inside all this arrow, we are encompassing all what is the perception of the external world. No? What the bee sees and feels and smells, what we know about the external world before we decide to bet, uh, uh, I don't know, 100 pounds on Brexit, for instance. Uh, this is all we know. But it's not the end of the story. There's another thing that goes from environment to agent, and it's crucial. It's also a reward. So this is a very crucial subject. So decision making is about rewards. It's a hedonistic theory. Agents want to maximize something. It has a goal, and this goal goes in form of rewards which come from the environment to the agent itself. Uh, and in particular, as we will see in a more formal way in a second, what it wants to maximize is some long-term measure of rewards. So it's not happy with it getting the best out of it at the moment, but in general, it might want to get something in the long run. That's a typical situation, okay? Uh, so let's get this thing formalized a bit. Uh, I will be as sloppy as a physicist can be, but uh, borrowing a notation from mathematics. So. Uh, so the key idea goes under the name of MDP, Markov Decision Processes. What are they? So the ingredients are simple. There, there are states. So the states belong to some space, which just to fix the ideas, you might sim simply think that this is a discrete set of states. Okay. So the world can be in, I don't know, 10 states. And you number them from 1 to 10 for simplicity. Of course, you, this can be extended to continuous spaces. Hilbert spaces, with all the difficulties that might ensue. But just for fixed areas, it's just a set of discrete states. Then there are actions. Again, you might think of this as discrete actions. Okay, I will do this or that, or I have three options or ten options. Of course, there are some options you can take depending on the state. Okay? So the action is, the action, uh, I will invest uh, 100,000 euros uh, on that particular bond is feasible if and only if your, the world, that is your bank account, is in a state which allows that action, okay? So this, state, this set of actions might be uh, more wider or smaller depending on uh, the state in which you are. Uh, so this is sort of the, the, the structure onto which the actual process, the real dynamical process takes place. Dynamical process which is intuitively contained in this loop. Because the agent will take action, this will change the environment, the agent will sense the environment and receive a reward, and in turn, act again, etc. So how do you formalize this process? Uh, you do that with a Markov chain, that is, you define a probability distribution for each state over the actions. It means that if you are in a state S, there will be a probability distribution of this, this possible action that you can take. This quantity is called the policy. It's a strategy. It's a way to map the states into actions. So this will be something that we want to make as best as possible depending on our specific interests. And then I have to model how, as a consequence of actions, the world will change. And this is also described in terms of a probability distribution, which is called, a, technically it's called the model of the environment. The 
means that given that the world is in a given state S and I choose action A as a result, I will end up in a new state S prime of the world with a certain probability distribution P. These two things together form what is called the Markov chain in the joint space of states of action and actions. So diagrammatically, in very compact form, uh, there is a state. According to my policy, I choose an action. And these two things together combined, given the, what, the, what the reaction of the environment to my actions is, will give rise to a new state as prime. And then I will again iterate this and next section and so on and so forth. So it seems a rather innocuous assumption that we're making here, but in fact it's an extremely strong assumption, that this one that this process behaves as a Markov chain. This Markovianity, in fact, is the, the simplest way you can think of, about it is the fact that it's, a, it's an extension of the notion of determinism to a probabilistic setting. What does that mean? It means that if at any given time, if at any given instant of time you know the probability distribution for your states, you will be able to predict the probability distributions for all future states. Okay, that's the Markov property. It's a very strong property, in fact. And we will see later when, and how it breaks down. So in particular, it means that in order for apply, to apply this kind of models to your decision making, you're assuming that the space of states is so large that every action combined with the state will give you an outcome in terms of probability that you can predict. Okay? So this is a very strong assumption. Uh, of course, as I said before, another important ingredient is the reward. So there is a reward, which in general might depend on the state, the action you take, and the state in which you end up uh, at the end. So this is the more general setting. These rewards themselves might be random. So it might be that if you are in a given state, you take an action, you end up in a new state, and if you try this thing several times, actually the rewards might vary from one time to another. That's possible, but in the following we'll be, be concerned, focusing on the case where this thing is actually, in this case, the average of those rewards, okay? So these are rewards. Uh, and then what is the goal of this uh, process? Uh, what do we want to do as an agent? We want to maximize the expected value. I will tell you in a second what this is of the sum over all future events, because we want to maximize something over the future, not over the past. That's the difficult part of it. Right? Of the sum of all the rewards that we will get at all future time steps, and now I'm adding here a, a factor here, which is called the discount factor, which stays from zero to, say, slightly less than one. This discount factor is a measure of the horizon that you have in your future. Suppose you don't, you don't expect to survive by tomorrow, you will set your gamma to a very small value because you will want to optimize everything in the short term. But if you have a very long expectancy, then your gamma will approach one. And you will, may want to accumulate these things over a very, very long. This changes drastically the kind of strategies that you might want to, as you can easily imagine, right? So why saving money if I 
the world is going to end tomorrow, for instance. But if my expectation is that I will live on for 30 years, then I might want to save money. Okay? So this quantity here is called the average return and is the form of cumulative uh, reward discounted over the future in some special way. Uh, so this seems to be a, quite a difficult problem in principle because you have to optimize this quantity starting from somewhere and sort of trying to predict whatever can happen in the future. Clearly, uh, you can imagine this gives rise to an enormous tree of possibilities. Uh, in order to evaluate this thing directly, you, might, you will have to check all of them according to a certain policy, right? So this, this expected value means that you adopt some policy pi and you will have different outcomes of your process, which is uh, stochastic by nature because these are probability distributions. And then averaging over all these possible outcomes and then you want to find the pi which does the best job. So this is a maximization over the policies. And the policy which does the best job is your optimal policy. Okay, so this might seem a very, very complicated problem in principle to deal with, but, but a very nice things happen. Very nice things happen here. Uh, and this nice thing is uh, the result of the combination of the fact that this process is Markovian and that the quantity that you want to optimize is a sum of things that happen over time. Okay? So at every step, you will make a new step and you will add something to your cumulative reward. So this sequential temporal structure is key to a result which is central to the theory of decision making, which is called the Bellman, Bellman's equation. Actually, the idea is very simple behind this Bellman's equation. It starts from the fact that for a given policy, you may split this sum into what you get at the first step, which is the immediate reward, plus the sum of what you will get after, discounted by gamma. Okay. So you can actually unroll this sum and write it, this thing here, which is actually defined as, say, the value beep, of a certain policy. You can write it in a recursive form. So specifically, suppose you start in initial state, which you want to call S. This will become a function of S. This is the value function called. Its interpretation is that this is what you get out of your policy pi if your initial state, the state from which you start from, is S. It's a function of the states. And this value function obeys this very simple and elegant Bellman's recursive equation, which states that the value of this state is just the sum of all possible actions by AS. I will write it and then comment it for you in a second. I'm repeating just for clarity. What is this telling you is that what you will get from your policy starting from S is what you get from the, on average from the first step because you will cho be choosing with probability pi an action A which will send you with probability P into a state as prime and will give you this reward on average. So this is what comes from the first step. In fact, if you set gamma to zero, which is just the one step horizon, that's all you get. You don't get the second part. The second part comes if you want to consider what ha will happen next. And what is that? It's just the fact that in this sum, 
you have taken out the first term, you take away the first gamma, and then you end up with the same sum. But now starting from a new point. So you see the recursive nature of this, of this expression. And this is just an outcome of the Markov property and the sequential nature of the goal that you set for your problem. Uh, this is also the basis for identifying the optimal strategy. Because what you want to do now is take the maximum of this equation over all possible policies. And this will identify a new function, which is the best thing that you can get out with your optimal policy starting from a state S. And if you do this operation of maximizing both sides, you get to another result, which is called the Bellman optimality equation. It tells that the optimal value of any state is the maximum overall policies sum A This is an equation for the optimal value. If we solve that, we also have the optimal policy. Because what the optimal policy does is it always tries to go from one state to another looking for the largest value of this function. So if I'm in a state S, I look around at all possible states where I can connect with my policy, and I will take the actions which brings me to the state with the largest V star, and so on and so forth. So this recursive equation contains the solution to my problem. If I can cast it, and that's the point, if I can cast it as a mark of decision process, I know how to solve the problem. So I map my complicated problem of planning, making decisions, look uh, in the future, into the far into the future, into an algorithm. Now it has become a computational problem to solve this equation. And the good news are that you can solve it in a very straightforward way. This general idea goes under the name of bootstrapping. You know what bootstrapping is? So once upon a time, shoes we used to come with straps here to pull them on, especially boots. Okay? So that was, the, I don't know whether it's still used, but the, there used to be a say in English which says, jumping over one fence by pulling each owns, one owns bootstraps, okay? So it describes something which is clearly unfeasible. You should be able to pull your bootstrap and then using this force to jump over a fence, okay? Uh, but that's exactly the principle that is here. So you solve this equation actually by doing this thing. You start from a guess. That's your bootstrap. You start from a guess for your function V and you put it inside this right-hand side and you maximize. This is something which you can do. If I give you a, a V, you will maximize the right-hand side somehow. And then, when you do that, taking the maximum, you have defined a new V. And you will plug that back in here, and so on and so forth. So the little miracle here that happens, it takes a while to, to prove it, but you can prove it, is that this operation converges to the actual maximum of this value function. So this provides you a way to compute optimal actions and values of states and etc. So yeah, there are technical assumptions that you might make on the or, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure Gordicity is for perhaps too strong, but uh, yeah, there are some assumptions, of course, yeah. If you divide your state space in blocks, of course, that, that, that wouldn't work. But, uh, okay. Uh,
That's the that's the the overall set of states, yeah, and, and actions. Yeah. What, what do you mean, the cardinality? I'm perhaps missing the question. How many policies? The set of policies. These are probability distributions, so they can take any value in a simplex in this s-dimensional space. Yes, for each state, the, for each s, you have a simplex, and then it's cardinality of s times the simplex s. Phi is a real number. Yes, yeah, for every state, you might have a actions, and then there's a probability distribution over this a action for each state. So it's a Cardinality of S, probability distributions. Okay, so uh, now the uh, everything has been wrapped up in the form of a algorithm, solving an algorithm. But then uh, Bellman himself quickly realized that. Besides all possible foundational problems that I will discuss in the following, there is one big computational issue with this problem itself. Uh, this comes when you come to consider examples. For instance, think about chess. Suppose you want to implement on a computer a solution of this Bellman's optimality equation for chess. And for chess, the number of legal accessible states, it's 10 to the 47. Big, big vector, okay? So in fact, that's absolutely not what computer chess players do. Yes? Sure, sure. It's, it's a different game, but just just to highlight the complexity of, of this thing, you just you suppose you are to play in an abstract way in which there are a list of actions that are fixed by your opponent. It doesn't react to your choices. Nonetheless, it would be impossible to to do that. Uh, totally. I will not come to multi agents because it's a long way to, to even to get to the end of single agents. <laughs> uh, no, sure. It's it's a totally perfect question to ask. Uh, so, these kind of approaches are actually not working for most uh, real decision-making problems, let alone when the space itself of states is continuous, which might be. If it's a robot that you want to operate, uh, it might take any kind of states and actions in continuous space, okay? Uh, so, of course, one, what one would like is to reduce the dimensionality of this problem, so to map it onto a smaller space in which there are relevant base vectors, which technically are called features, and perhaps solving the problem into this subspace with limited number of features, this might uh, lead to, to a solution. Another way is to do it in a nonlinear way by using neural networks to approximate these complicated functions and use them to solve this problem, okay? So there has been a lot of work in, in the past years in trying to address these kind of problems from the point of view of function approximation and generalization, okay? Actually, first real good chess player from Tesauro was using, trying to solve the Bellman optimality equation with function approximation using neural networks, okay? So this was this combination of things that uh, brought uh, the first uh, good chess player to life. Uh, now, I will not dwell on this because there's something more urgent in my, my agenda than this. Is, is, uh, essentially, it's about the fact that uh, this is not a very good starting point for decision making, real decision making. There are at least two big issues here. The first big issue is that it nearly never happens that the environment gives us, as a signal, its state. In a sense here, 
by saying that the system is Markovian, we are assuming a perfect knowledge and observability of the environment. But what we get, what animals get, is just cues. Very limited information about the environment. So that's the first problem that I will address in the second part of the lecture. And then there is another problem, which we also, we don't know what the model of the environment is. This would be just like knowing all the laws of nature. Uh, if you know the states, you know what I do. This is a Laplace dream. If I give you initial conditions, etc., you will be able to predict everything in the future. But we don't know what the rules are. You cannot even guess what these probabilities are. So how do we deal with that? So there is a problem of limited observability, which is what kind of signals we actually get from the environment. And there's a problem of predictability. How accurate is our model of the environment if it's there? Just for clarity, I will separate these two parts. So I will first discuss the situation in which you, you don't get a precise picture of the environment. And then, this, but you have a model of it, so you know how it will react, but just don't know what the real S is. Just like get a faint image, the shadow in Plateau's cave. And then you have to decide nonetheless, given the partial information that you have about the environment. So in this case, you don't know the states exactly, but you know how the system will, would react if you knew the states. Then a complementary situation, if you wish, is when you know the states, but you have no model of the environment. And eventually, the great synthesis of this is building up algorithms that are able to deal with both. So with, incomplete obs with partial observation and incomplete knowledge of the laws. So, uh, so let's start over again now, assuming that we don't get from the environment the full, all the full information that we might want. This will change radically the nature of our problem because as we will see, it will not be just a problem of computing good actions, but it will be a problem of learning things, learning how to act. So if you have any questions about the first pass, um, I'm taking anyone. Yes, please. It's been a great success story in the 50s. <laughs> uh, and then people realize that if you have large systems and then you say, OK, I will just map my system with the system with small number of states, then you get very, very far away from real good solutions. And this is something I will discuss for us right now. So what's the source of this problem? So. The next step, and I will just use the same uh, many things that are already on the blackboard to, to optimize over time, uh, is to go to another level, which includes Markov decision processes, but is broader. And this new level is a level which goes under the name of partially observable Markov decision processes. So what's the idea? The idea is that there is a Markov process underlying, okay? So the world has its own laws, which are here, and I know them, but I don't know exactly where I am. Because the environment doesn't send me the state in which it is. It just sends me some observation. It's just like, suppose you were checking your bank account to decide if you want to buy that flight or no, and you want to check if your savings account is, has money enough to decide, and then the bank replies, oh, okay, you might have $1,000 with a certain probability, and then perhaps 10000 with a smaller probability. Okay, you get some partial information 
And we have to decide nonetheless. Can you do that optimally? That's the typical situation which animals face. Animals decide, I would have to go and look for, uh, so an insect try to look for a mate by smelling pheromones in the air, okay? And the location of the, in, of, the male, of the female perhaps is somewhere over there, but it gets just the odor out of it. And from the odor, which is a very messy information, it has to, to guess, to learn, where actually the female is. So very partial information. If you knew it, if you just knew it, if you just knew it where the female was, then it would be a problem of optimizing the, the straight, the trajectories. So I would drive like this way, perhaps there's wind, and then I will have to drive this way. Okay, so that would be a mark of decision process. But they get just very partial information, and they have to deal with that. So how do you do when you're in such a situation? Okay. So there are new things appearing here in this problem. Some of them are all the same. There are states and there are actions. Now there's a new thing. So there are observations. And there's also a model of these observations, which is a probability distribution that I will make an observation y, given that I end up in state S prime with action A. The choice of S prime is only customary in the literature. It could have been S, or S, A, S prime, whatever. So this is a model of observation. It tells you Fact that if I make an observation y, this happens with a certain probability given that the world was in state as prime and I, I took action A. Okay. So this is still you need. And the goal is the same. But now the point is, what is the policy? How do you define a policy? So I, I erased it Exactly because the first choice didn't make sense. The first choice was to create a map which goes from states to actions. But if you don't know in which state you are, how, how can you build such a policy? So you have to change the notion of a, what a policy is in the context of partially observable market decision processes. And uh, to address this issue, I will probably spend just five minutes with a very simple example of what a Markov decision process is and what a partial observable Markov decision process is to highlight the differences. So, and then we will get back to the, to the basics, to the idea of what a policy is for a partially observable Markov decision process. So the example is, is, is very simple. It's a system which can be only in two states. S1 and S2. So very simple structure of the state space, just two states, and very simple actions. So if I'm in state S1 and I take action A2, I get a reward plus R. This is a some positive number, okay? Or I can take action one, which sends me again state S1 and gives me a negative reward, a punishment of the same amplitude for simplicity. But if I take action one from status two, this will give me a positive reward as well. Whereas if I take action two from state S2, this will punish me again with minus R. So you see, the same actions in different states give different outcomes. Because in one case it sends into itself, in another case it sends you into the other state. So what's the best policy for this system? You, you see, it's very simple because it's not even stochastic. So you, you go from one state to another with certain with probability one if you take some certain action, okay? So it's a very simple and you can easily guess 
what is the best strategy to take if this is a mark of decision process. So if you know in which state you are, the best thing you would do, if you start from state S1, what would you do? Well, I would take action A2, which will send me in state 2. Well, I will take action A1, etc., and A2. The best policy is clearly, if I am in S1, choose A2. If I am in S2, choose A1. Because it's the same action, it just depends on which state you are. So suppose you have a screen in front of you, and the screen may be green or red. And the actions are push the I or push the J. But if the screen is red and I push the I, I get one euro. If the screen is green and I push the I, I get minus one euro. And this will flip red and green. Because these are really the real same action that you perform but it has a different effect on the state in which you are. It's an example which is a little bit cooked for, for the purpose of showing what I will be showing now. But it's clear that the best strategy is, is, is clearly is obvious here from this, from this standpoint. Uh, so from S1, you take action two, and from S2, you will take action one. That's the best policy for the mark of decision process. Now I will introduce a partially observable mark of decision process derived from this one. And this partially observable mark of decision process is actually very simple. My observations are awful. So every time, at every time I, I perform this process, I just get the same result. You are in state three. You are in state three. You are in state three. So you're not able to tell in which state you are. It's a, the worst case of partial observation. It's no observation at all. So the question is, can you act as best as possible in such a setup? So in order to, to answer to this question and to see how this can guide us to the formulation of the right way to act in the uh, presence of partial observability, uh, Let's look at very simple strategies. The first simple strategy that you might think of is deterministic. You just take one action and stick with that. Uh, if you do that, it's clearly very stupid because if I take action A1, if I'm here, I will get minus R, minus R, minus R, minus R. And if it's A2, I will get plus R at the first stop and then minus R, minus R, minus R. So it doesn't really matter what gamma you take, if it's in the long run, this is going to be a very bad strategy. So deterministic strategies in which you decide to stick onto one particular action. Remember, you don't know whether you are S1 or S2. These are very bad. Even but you're you know. Yeah. I know. I, that's what I said at the beginning. I know the models, but I don't know the states. It's just like there are some hidden Markov model which I want to control in technical terms. There's a model which uh, is Markov. I don't see it. I don't see the outcome of this model, but I want to control it nonetheless. Uh, so even the, the random strategy in which you pick by chance action A1 and A2 totally at random does better than this because on average you get zero, which is better than the negative sum that I was getting a second ago. But there's something smarter that you can do. Suppose that now you allow the agent to remember what was its, its past action. If it remembers what was its past action, then the best strategy that it can do, a good strategy actually that it can do, is do the opposite. Was I taking action A1? Next time I will take A2 and alternate between these two actions. In this case, even if you start with the wrong action, Eventually, we will enter in the right loop. So suppose here is the, okay, I will start with action A1. I will get the penalty, minus R. That's bad. But now I remember that I took action one. Then I will take action two, which will give me plus. And then I will take action one, which will give me plus, and then I will start alternating. Okay, so it's clearly conceived to show the example. But the basic idea, the basic 
take-home message is that you can do very good things if you allow the system to remember what were its past actions. If you allow the notion of a history. If it's able to learn from experience, to collect experience, it is able to do well even in a situation where it doesn't have access to the real system. So the notion of a, a good strategy in this case, uh, or, or of, a, of a strategy uh, in general, is that you have to map histories into actions. So you will have, in the past, I have chosen action A1, I have made observation Y1, I have got the reward R1, and at the second step, A2, Y2, R2, then AT minus 1, uh, y t minus one. So this is all the history of the things that happened in the past. Actions, observations, rewards. You just keep a very detailed record of what happened in the past. And from that record, you decide your new action at time t. That's the way you map histories into actions. Now, this the fact that you have accounted for history is very important because when you had partial observations, you completely destroyed the mark of nature of the process. Because it's just like having a process which is going to a very high dimensional space and you're looking at the projection of it. And of course, it's difficult to predict what will happen in the future if you have a very low dimensional projection of a dynamics which goes in the high dimensional space. So this Partial observability breaks Markovianity, but the introduction of a history restores it. Because a process which goes over histories is always Markovian. You're always keeping track of all the past and accumulating knowledge as you go on and go forth. So, you can imagine keeping track of all this long track of events is particularly cumbersome. So it's important to, to know that there is one way of compounding all this information about the past history into a more compact object, which is called the belief. What is it? The belief is a very simple object. It's a probability distribution over states. So these Bs are positive quantities, which summed over all states come up to one. And uh, if you assume that you start with a certain belief, which is your belief that you, at the initial time, are in a state S, you don't know it, but you can form a belief out of it. Okay? You might attach to every state of the world some probability that you actually are in that state. And if you do that, and you update these beliefs with your observations, so you use your experience to go from one time step to the following one, and you do that by Bayes' rule. That is, the, the new belief after an observation and an action that you take will be uh, the probability of having made that observation given the new state and uh, actually it's right, uh, sum over uh, every, don't mess anything here, no, that's And then I have sum over S prime of the This gives you the rule by which you will update your beliefs 
as you gain new experience. You take action, you make observations, and you update your beliefs. That's just Bayes' rule for conditional probabilities. So this description in terms of beliefs, which means that you have to carry over as you do your decision-making process this probability distribution, uh, is actually equivalent to taking track, keeping track of all the history. So this thing is what it's technically called a sufficient statistic for all the history. So why is that useful? Because at this point, the partially observable mark of decision process can be remapped into a mark of decision process, which now takes place in the space of beliefs. What does that mean? So in the mark of decision process, we had a state, a set of states, which I said were discrete, like that. And we had a policy which mapped states into actions. And in partially observable mark of decision processes, there's not anymore this space of states. There's this space of beliefs, which is a continuous space by definition. It's a simplex. I'll draw like this, but it's in multidimensional space. And then your policy is something which maps beliefs into actions. If you accept this mapping, you will be able to write down a Bellman equation also for this value function in the space of beliefs. It's a very high price to pay because you've moved from a discrete space to a continuous space of probabilities. So actually, the solution of this problem is even more difficult than the previous one. But nonetheless, the key message is here is that if you keep account of history, if you keep account of this in terms of beliefs, then you can approach this problem formally in the same way as you did. So you can define optimal strategies. You can try to compute them by methods, by certain numerical methods. So, To conclude this part, I would just uh, probably mention uh, one specific class of this partially observable mark of decision process, which is, has been studied a lot in the literature uh, and for which there are very special results. Uh, these problems are called multi armed bandits. slot machines. Suppose you have a set of n slot machines. You can play one slot machine at a time. They give random, randomly distributed rewards. And you want to play to get the best out of it. So one of these machines will have the largest average. And you want to play and discover what it is, and eventually play only that machine in the long run. This is a partially observable mark of decision process of a very special kind because your actions don't change the state of the world. Machines, in this case, will not react to your actions by changing the probability, which is what happens in real slot machines, by the way. If you happen to win too much, they will downgrade you. But in these naive slot machines, you just have to discover what they are. But you have to discover this by playing. And this is very important as an example because uh, it sets in great clarity what is the problem, the big problem of learning under partial observability. Is that you have, from the analysis of this, of this kind of models, you have to combine two opposing requirements. First, you want to exploit the information that you have about the system. So if you have experience that this slot machine typically gives high rewards, you want to exploit this information and play that machine more frequently. But nonetheless, at the same time, you want to explore. Because if you stick with the best machine from the very beginning, you might be just out of bad luck, losing the opportunity to sample other actions that at the 
initial time seems to be uh, less good, given the current information. So this counter, uh, this trade-off between exploration and exploitation is one of the key aspects that emerged from the studies of this partially observable decision-making process. Uh, this is something which is crucial. In all decision-making problems, if you strike the right balance between exploration and exploitation, you will be optimal. But if you miss it, you will fail miserably. And this comes from the study of this kind of simplified partially observable mark of decision process. So uh, I could expand a lot on this. So if, if you're interested, I, I can, I can uh, discuss more about this in, uh, at the end of lecture. But now I need to, to cut it short because I want to discuss about the other problem which emerges when you don't know how the environment behaves. Can you act optimally in that case? So this uh, so the framework is, is, is the same again, essentially. Uh, as I said before, in order to simplify things, let's restore again the fact that uh, the environment gives states and not only observations, but we don't know this. So our policy gets back to the initial problem. I have to determine it in function, as a function of states. Observations are perfect. I don't know what the model is. So this goes under the name of model free decision making. So the question is can we optimize this target again over possible policies? without knowing how the world will react to our actions, without knowing the laws of nature? The answer is yes, it's provided by uh, a series of very, uh, very important techniques uh, which come from, uh, directly from mathematics. And uh, I will very quickly outline them to you. So, the very basic idea that's behind this method is that uh, you want to compute these things without knowing the P. And if you don't know the P, still you can do one thing, that is you can sample. Suppose that the world just gives you outcomes. You choose actions and the world gives you new states. But doesn't tell you how it generates the new states. Can you, on the basis of just this information that you get, the fact that you, I choose an action and I get reward and states only, without knowing what the rule is, can I do that? So if you look at this, the problem is the same. I want to maximize this quantity. So this problem of maximizing the expectation of something which is random has actually been addressed in mathematics in the, again in the 50s uh, by a large body of work that goes under the name of stochastic uh, approximation methods. They are very simple in, uh, in their idea. And to discuss them, I will just need to, to recall 
the, the very simple uh, starting point, which is the Bellman's equation, you remember. So the, in a nutshell, the main result of the stochastic, stochastic approximation methods is that if you devise an algorithm which, starting from a guess of your value function at the beginning, updates, updates this according to this rule, And you require that this alpha t, which are called learning rates, that this sum diverges, but this sum converges. You use this scheme to approximate your value function, and at each step, you choose a policy according to your current value function, allowing for some exploration. This algorithm will converge to the optimal solution with probability one. This method is called temporal difference learning. This is the uh, state ST, the state that was previously visited. Thank you. So you update the, the value of the function of the state that you just visited. You don't update the others. Yes. So there's a yeah, there's delta that I'm not writing here if you want to write it from the vector. Algorithmically, you just every step you just keep track of the state you just visited and you update that. You can do something better is update many states at a time. It's just uh, an upgraded version of this temporal difference learning. Uh, so, you see, the, the, the good thing of this is that in order to do this, you don't need the model of the environment. You just need to receive rewards and to receive states. The fact that the system itself produces the states according to your probability distribution P takes care of it. So that this will converge to the optimal solution. And there are different uh, versions of this, including actions without actions, separating actions from states, uh, actions from uh, states, yes. Uh, so there are many, many of these methods which go under the name of Q-learning, uh, SARSA, actor-critic methods. You can have many of them depending on the kind of architecture that you use to solve the problem. But again, the key point is that this kind of algorithms without knowledge of the model, model-free, can get you to the exact solution. The policy here is what is, in, is implied in the fact that you will generate the new state as t plus one, okay? According to a policy which is the best policy according to V, to your current estimate, plus some exploration. You can, you can do this in different ways, that's what I was, uh, was alluding to. You can choose your, from your value function, you can construct different policies with different recipes. Each of these recipe goes under the name of actor critic or Q learning, etc. All of them have to share just a single property, which is they have to explore enough. And this requires parameter tuning. 
But the downside of this is that there are parameters which you will have to tune to get your convergence as fast as possible to, to learning. This guarantees you that you will converge, but the way to converge fast to the optimal solution, well, there's no real result on that for this kind of setup. So time to wrap up and attempt the synthesis. So the, the, the holy grail of decision making is to come up with a theory which accounts for all these, these things together. Lack of knowledge about the rules that nature, uh, by which nature works, uh, and partial observability, which I was discussing before. There are many empirical attempts at building such kind of algorithms, but I think it's fair to say that there's no comprehensive uh, description of the full-fledged uh, problem of uh, uh, decision making. Uh, that was all for the time, and I'm happy to take questions if there are. Could you please speak up? I'm a little bit deaf. Yes. So, uh, in the in the belief case, so even in I don't know. I hope that that answers the question. But if not, just just correct me. Uh, even if you have a discrete number of states. The, so the problem of solving the Bellman, is, Bellman equation in the space of beliefs is extremely hard. It's, it's in the class of P-space complete problems. So if I understand well, you, were, you wanted to have continuous beliefs on, over continuous state space. Okay. I cannot think of any other nightmare worse than that, but uh, people try to address this problem by Approximating, so you're saying, okay, my first space is perhaps uh, rep well represented by a set of bases, and I will project my problem onto that, and I will find approximate solutions. But of course, it's a it's an empirical approach to the problem. I don't know of any result in such a setup. Yes. Yeah. It means that uh, if you know, if you start with the, with the, with the prior, it's an issue of distribution, uh, and then you update your beliefs according to the Bayes rule, and you end up with the final posterior, this contains exactly the same information as the string of all your observations. There's nothing more you can add, not, nothing else that you can leave. So that, that's the notion of sufficient statistics. Any, any observable uh, computer starting from the belief will, will have exactly the same content of information of any other computer from the string of uh, uh, observations. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So, so in the in the bees model and in the insect search model, the biggest source of uncertainty is in the partial observability, because in that case, the model of your actions is just that the bee is be as a, has to be able to to foresee that if she decides to fly in that direction, after one second she will be one meter closer to the. So it's in how good she is in computing its position in space. And we know that many animals are extremely good at that. 
So if I should point to the biggest source of uncertainty is, the, is in the partial observability. It's the fact that they have to rely on a very, very unreliable signal such as odor in, uh, in, uh, in the field for that case. But there are others where there are different cases, for instance, in which uh, uh, so dragonflies dragonflies uh, are able to catch an insect which is flying while they are flying and they do so by intercepting it. So in that case they have the biggest difficulty is to build the right model of the environment, which is the other insect. But they are able to do so. Uh, so in that case, it's, it's a different. Because they observe very well, they have very good sight, so they sort of know what are the relevant uh, coordinates of the system. And, but the big thing is, you know, given that I see that insect, it seems to fly at that speed, where will it be in one second where I will intercept it? So in that case, all the way is, is, is on build, knowing the right model, having learned it from, uh, from evolution and experience. Yeah. One learns from the bees. Yeah, yeah. Actually, one learns a lot from the bees and the monkeys and our brain. Actually, uh, for instance, just to, to focus on this example of model-free learning, uh, there's one discovery uh, which is one of the most nice in neuroscience, uh, according to my taste, is that in the brain there are neurons which actually compute this thing. So they fire in such a way which is absolutely compatible to the computation of this thing. So there are parts of our brain which actually implement this algorithm. They do temporal difference learning and react accordingly. So they're, they're part of a dopamine uh, chain of reward and... Uh, so I was just curious to know this, Yeah, it was, it was a two-way process by which people started thinking... Uh, so there were models of uh, this kind of... I, I mean, all these ideas come from uh, operant learning and conditioned learning. So initially, all, all this was Pavlov. And people tried to formalize the observations of Pavlov by which dogs learn to respond to stimuli and even in presence of delay. And then they got to the neuroscience and then they got back to, to computer science and it was completely going back and forth. So, and just, just one example. Another example which I didn't discuss is about deep learning, which is something which is very popular. Deep learning is about the problem of constructing a representation of the world. So it's uh, just like understanding which is the good set of base states for my space of states. Okay? So these ideas, which are now very popular in computer science, came from neuroscience, just from vision. People were looking at the visual system, how the area in the visual cortex are organized, and then try to export it into computer science and then getting back to neuroscience again. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, permeable interface between biology and, uh, and computer science. Well, in, in this case, actually, you don't, you don't need them to know what the shape of the reward function is. You just get it. It's going to be whatever it is. Uh, so I don't know if you're concerned about, the, about what, what are the conditions that one has to impose on this thing to, for this algorithm to converge, which are, of course, there, there, must, there must be some condition on uh, uh, the probability distribution of these random rewards for this algorithm to converge. But in general, here, we're not assuming anything. It's, it's, this is really model-free. The only thing you, have, you need to know is that there's going to be a set of states. Of course, this is going to be limiting. Again, you cannot learn to play chess with this because this vector is anyway to be 10 to the 47. So there's, it, there's other limitation. But again, I tried to split the two problems into different parts just for simplicity. But the full problem mixes both of them.
Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the way you schedule this thing and the way you fix your parameters, the way you transform this thing into actions all contain parameters that in this approach you will have to tune. There's no other way out. And also, the discount function, of course, it affects the, the speed at which you learn. And, uh, just think, think, about, think about the problem of search. The problem of search is a typical problem in which the reward comes after. I mean, you have to fly, you have to go around, and then you have to get to the female, and then perhaps you will get the reward. <laughs> okay? That's life. But then it's a very distant target in time, and in that case, of course, you cannot expect to be learning anything with this approach unless you get there, the process ends, and then it starts a new trial, etc. Of course, that's, that's why we believe that this thing doesn't work in the search process, because they have to do it in one shot. And this doesn't work in one shot. You have to make many, many trials before learning. But if you have a model, you can go there in one shot. Uh, 